I, I'm, gon I'm going to talk about very local example, which was actually very important in a global dimension of uh, oil production, oil trade, and also uh, politics in the end of 19th century about uh, uh, Austrian Galicia, and uh, which at the end of uh, 19th century, at the beginning of 20th century, was the third uh, place of oil production in the world. So the first two were Baku, uh, in modern Azer Azerbaijan and uh, Pennsylvania in the United States. And the third one was Galicia, uh, which also included Bubrka, you mentioned uh, you mentioned a uh, uh, few, few minutes earlier, uh, but I will uh, uh, speak about uh, the very center of it uh, in Eastern Galicia. So what, what is Galicia? Let's start from uh, this question. Uh, when we see here a map of Austrian-Hungarian Empire uh, from the uh, uh, 1910, uh, you can see uh, Vienna, yes, like a capital of, uh, of Austrian Empire. Uh, and when we go to the toward east, we, we can see a province which was called Galicia. Uh, and which was split in West Galicia and East Galicia. Uh, and a uh, main city, which is the most famous, and you probably heard about it, is Lviv, also my home city. Uh, but uh, an uh, oil industry developed uh, since uh, middle of uh, 19th century, a little bit of sou southern part uh, of uh, this area here, uh, where I put this uh, Round thing with the name Drohobych and Boryslav. That's where the main center of uh, of oil industry and Drohobych is also uh, famous uh, to people who are interested in literary studies because it's a home uh, place of a famous Jewish uh, Jewish Polish author uh, Bruno Schulz and uh, who, who wrote about it and who was also remotely connected to to the oil uh, oil uh, industry and. Uh, Let's let's speak a little bit about it. Uh, this case, perhaps you you are uh, some people can hear about it for the first time, but it is uh, relatively famous. Uh, there is a one major book by uh, American author Alison Flake Frank, which is called Oil Empire, who researched oil in Galicia and who tried to challenge the idea of progress because we have this idea that oil, that industry is bringing us progress, it is bringing us uh, to the future, it's developing, it helps to develop our countries. And she, she wrote how oil in, in this area in Galicia didn't, didn't help, yes, didn't help to develop uh, the progress and uh, how in some way it's even uh, was more, more, more helpful to to uh, uh, to deepen the uh, social differences and social gaps in the area. Uh, the other uh, the other famous book, uh, which is mostly it's a fiction a narrative uh, with uh, academic introduction. It's called the Jewish Oil Magnets of Galicia. As I will as I'm going to speak today, the Jews were major players in this oil industry at some moment. And um, we have a book by uh, Valery Shatsker uh, who discuss the, participa uh, the participation of Jewish players. And uh, there is also a, a book about Ukrainian author Ivan Franko, uh, written by famous scholar uh, Yaroslav Hrezak, uh, who, who tries to explore how people in 19th century, how um, thinkers, intellectuals used Boroslav as a way to prove some of their theories. Uh, so when you were uh, when you were, uh, lived in Galicia, which was mainly agricultural province, there were there was no much industry there. You saw uh, you saw Boroslav, which looked uh, as on this pictures you expected to have a labor movement there. And so Yaroslav Hrezak, he, he explores uh, the story of one of the intellectuals who tried to fi find a labor movement in, uh, in Boroslav in this area, but who, who didn't, didn't find it because it was everything was uh, much more complicated. And uh, when we speak about oil now, you know that we use it for uh, for transportation, yes, for uh, for cars. Uh, the oil in the uh, mid of 19th century was uh, mainly used uh, for the light. Yes, so uh, you can see the gas lamp, uh, the way of how to have to produce uh, uh, light via uh, via gas uh, gas lamp uh, was developed in the mid, uh, middle of 19th century. 
And uh, then uh, this, this area, Eastern Galicia, became important. Uh, in, and on the left, you see the other product, which is also connected to the oil, which is not very, very famous right now. It's called Ozokerite or uh, Aris Wax, and uh, which was used for isolation on, on for some other part of industry. But it was very unique for the for this uh, part of um, for this part of empire. And here I put a, a small timeline how have it all developed. So we have the beginnings at 1850s, 1860s. We have industry is more consol uh, consolidated and uh, bigger uh, since 1870s, 1890s. In 1890s uh, and 1905, this is the high high point of the industry development. It's also the moment when international, big international companies are coming uh, to the area. So Austria and Galicia, I will speak in a moment about its multicultural uh, multicultural uh, character, uh, which was populated mainly by Polish, uh, Jewish, and Ukrainian population. Uh, however, people who developed the industry we were French, uh, Americans, uh, Canadian, yes, so people who came from, from far, far away, who had uh, capital, who, who, could, uh, who could develop it at this, uh, at this third stage. And after 1905, when the industry, when the, the sources of oil were mostly exhausted, uh, the industry was in a bit of decline, and it still continue to exist even now. Uh, if you Google Boroslav and Rohobic, you will see uh, the oil wells, which are still ac uh, active in the, in, the, in, the, in the sound, but it's not uh, profitable enough. It's not worth exploiting it uh, uh, right now. Mm. However, how this industry, so we didn't bring wells to Galicia, but it changed. It transformed uh, small towns. Yes, it transformed the uh, the, the places uh, there. And uh, the first place was the place where this oil was 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 situated, was located, and the most of wells were located. So it was a small village, uh, Boroslav. Uh, in uh, 1850, it had uh, 750 inhabitants, and in 19, uh, 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 on the beginning of 20th century, it held uh, 12,500 uh, inhabitants. And, uh, uh, however, it looked like on this picture, it didn't have um, a good infrastructure for local people. It didn't have enough schools or enough uh, enough places to uh, to uh, to live. Yes, and people who lived in Boroslav they mostly complained. Uh, uh, it consisted of housing uh, for workers. Uh, which was also very uncomfortable uh, and, uh, and uh, poorly developed. A lot of people visited Boroslav at the end of 19th century because, as I mentioned, it was a unique place in Galicia. It was uh, something you, you like, the only, if you want to see industry, you come, you come, you have to come to Boroslav because there is no other place where you can see it. And people like to de describe the terrible condition uh, of the workers and uh, Boroslav inspired a uh, few novels, short stories, and it inspired uh, a lot of writers to, to write about it. Uh, however, we had another city which was uh, nearby, City Drohobic. As I mentioned, it was a place where uh, Bruno Schulz, a uh, famous author, was born. And uh, it was serving as a living space for uh, richer, uh, richer entrepreneurs who built their villas and, 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 and uh, quarters, living quarters uh, there. It also served as a, a center of administration. Uh, it was uh, a regional, a regional, uh, regional center, and it was also a center of religious and culture for all three communities: for Ukrainians, uh, Poles, and Jews. Here you can see a synagogue, uh, which was uh, built in uh, in the Hobbit, uh, and which was modeled on a German synagogue uh, in uh, city Kassel. Mm, and uh, Drohobit uh, is uh, definitely a, a place which profited mostly from uh, from the uh, from the industry, which became famous because of it, and uh, which allowed uh, the entrepreneurs uh, who were employed in the industry to influence the political life uh, and uh, influence administration and to to be active uh, active uh, socially. However. Most of them didn't stay there, and uh, the second generation of oil entrepreneurs uh, already uh, tried to move away uh, to bigger places like Lviv or Vienna. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, one of the uh, most famous uh, thing uh, uh, about uh, uh, when 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 Drohobic became famous in the empire was a visit of uh, uh, Kaiser uh, of uh, the Emperor uh, Franz uh, Franz Joseph in in uh, 18, uh, 1880s. And here you can see how different communities. This picture was painted afterwards, like 20, 20 years years afterwards. But the visit of Emperor remained very very vivid in a in a in a local memory because it was also a visit to the to, to see the industry. So the Emperor itself himself uh, was uh, was interested in how. Uh, what industry is, can it help to rescue Galicia from poverty, and uh, how uh, how it can be uh, how it can be uh, important for um, uh, uh, for for the country. And here you you you, main, you see mainly Polish uh, Polish inhabitants because it was painted by Polish author. Uh, however, most of the people uh, who were employed in the industry uh, in the time of visit of Emperor uh, Franz Joseph were Jewish. And I will speak about them in a minute. So uh, when we see here is a, a chart which shows a population, a Drohobic population in uh, uh, 1869. It was growing, uh, of course, until the beginning of 20th century. However, it, uh, the proportion remained uh, mostly the same. So uh, most of the people were Polish, uh, then you had Jewish people, and then you had Ukrainians. And more, uh, it was more or less uh, equal. Uh, and they were involved, but the involvement of uh, in industry was different for uh, uh, for every community. And uh, in this, I, I, I spoke about few stages. And in these early stages, until big business, big companies come, the Jews were main power of the industry because they were the uh, people who had capital and who had idea how to how to trade. Uh, and they were very, very visible, and uh, they also um, were visible in a different uh, areas. Uh, also, as an uh, uh, so, you you may see like a difference. Yes, the, the people on these two pictures come from uh, different uh, social uh, social uh, classes, and uh, people on the left were, uh, they, they they come from a big uh, uh, family. Uh, um, of oil entrepreneurs, it became very famous. Uh, family of Gartenbergs, um, uh, and who uh, who later moved to uh, to Vienna, who, uh, who who remained in business for a very long time. And people uh, on the left, they were also Jewish, uh, but they were Jewish workers. And uh, this uh, fact that uh, Boroslav had uh, Jewish uh, Jewish workers was something unique in, in 19th century Galicia, uh, because in professional structure, most of them. Mm, uh, uh, in professional structures, uh, Jews usually were engaged as so-called middleman minority. Uh, so they were participating in uh, they were participating in um, um, as traders uh, or as uh, uh, as merchants, uh, small uh, as craftsmen, but uh, not so often as uh, workers. And that's why also Boroslav. So Boroslav transformed this industry, transformed this professional structure, and in some way it has transformed relations between different uh, different ethnicities. Uh, uh, we see uh, conflicts uh, between uh, between diff different workers in uh, in Boroslav. Uh, however, uh, we, we uh, and until some point we don't see anti uh, anti Jewish violence uh, because typical perhaps for uh, other uh, other part of the uh, empire. And uh, and uh, this this vividness of uh, this uh, unusual structure is also attracted uh, uh, modern intellectuals. It attracted Zionists. Uh, who uh, who came to Drohobic, who came to Boroslav, who observed the industry and who discussed uh, how uh, how it shows uh, that people, uh, the Jews, can be also very productive. They can work in uh, in a, in an industry. And uh, uh, people who were rich, uh, uh, Jewish, uh, Jewish entrepreneurs, they were rela related uh, between uh, themselves. So uh, they were often had family connections. Uh, they were uh, mm, 
very active in uh, city council in, in politics because in Austrian Hungarian Empire uh, Jews uh, didn't have they didn't suffer from uh, at, the, at that moment from the discrimination that could in, in, in could be engaged in political life and they engage uh, very actively in uh, local uh, political life uh, sometimes uh, cooperating with, between uh, between also with uh, Polish and with uh, Ukrainian uh, with Ukrainian uh, politicians. Mm. Uh, however, at the beginning, at the uh, 1920s, after World War I, uh, Boroslav, it still looked like on a picture, uh, but it uh, didn't remind the rich uh, town it's supposed to be. And uh, mm, uh, here is a, a small mm, quotation uh, from a writer, a uh, Warsaw writer, Joel uh, Mazboim, who uh, wrote in Yiddish and who visited uh, Galicia in 1928. And he described how this industry, how this half of century of industry transformed uh, the city. And so he said that uh, Boroslav at night with its, uh, his hundreds of lights reminds the hell of the living and the dead. Uh, with moving and immovable bodies. Uh, uh, Boroslav looks more empty than an urban village. Uh, long streets of wooden houses, rows of poor and dirty wooden sidewalks a mile away. So yes, so we have the industry which are, is in the city since 1850s, but we still have no city. As you don't see the city structure, it looks very poor, more similar to a village. Uh, but when you look at the big buildings of Galicia and the Carpathian companies, these were name of the companies which uh, extracted oil and traded oil, uh, the thousands of telephone and telegraph buyers stretching here and there, and the thousands of regular workers running around the streets, you uh, understand you are in a big capitalist center. And no other city uh, observes so much gold and dirt the, and the contrast of poverty and wealth as in Boris. So it was very, very unusual from the rest of Galicia, it was very different. And uh, so uh, city, city Boroslav, it did not, uh, it did not uh, um, profited from uh, um, the, uh, uh, from the oil, uh, oil industry. However, it's this wealth, it contributed to some uh, some spaces. Uh, mostly uh, here we see uh, what was uh, what what was the result yes, of a wealth of these Jewish uh, Jewish oil uh, families, uh, like an orphanage in uh, in Drohobych, uh, or a um, real uh, big uh, big uh, house in Arnova style in Lviv, uh, which you can see on the left. And uh, 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 passage uh, trade passage uh, in uh, in uh, also in another Galician Galician city. So this uh, this wealth it helped to uh, it helped families to 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 live uh, um, uh, to live life much much more higher quality, uh, but it didn't help to uh, to redeem this uh, poor uh, Jewish uh, workers or poor Ukrainian workers who were. Uh, who were living in, in Boroslav and who at that moment were suffering from a bad life condition. Yeah, so once again, my talk today will be based on our collective article with Professor Alexander Atkins from European University Institute and Dr. Bogdan Shomilovic from Center for Urban History. We worked on it uh, in 2018 and the results of our cooperation were published in 2020. And now I present this in 2022. So to start, I want to draw a link with uh, Lada's presentation and start mine with uh, this image of an imperial visit. This picture shows the emperor of Austria-Hungary, Franz Joseph I, getting off the train in the provincial capital of Lviv. The monarch was on his trip to the Habsburg province of Galicia to inspect what in the words of Ukrainian writer Ivan Franco was the land of oil and salt. Both resources were extracted in the area of the Rohobach and Boroslav, which Kaiser visited in September 1880. Among others, this short two hours visit resulted in the foundation of a mine that was named after Franz Joseph. And the next image, 
shows the general secretary of the Communist Party of the USSR, Leonid Brezhnev, on his trip by Trans-Siberian Railroad. Judging by the date of uh, this photo, it was taken in Tumen. Brezhnev visited the Siberian city on the 30th of March, and this visit had considerable consequences for the way Soviet oil industry developed during the next 10 years. Post-war decades showed that methods of the Soviet economy proved to be more successful in the area of oil extraction than in the sphere of agriculture. As a result, from 1970 to 1985, the Soviet purchases of foreign grain increased 20-fold. This trend reflected the state priorities. In the 1970-1986, the rate of capital investments in the oil and gas industry was three to five five times higher than in the Soviet economy as a whole. So after his visit to Western Siberia, Brezhnev ordered the Minister of Oil Industry, Nikolai Maltsev, to increase the oil extraction by 10 million tons. And thus, the plan for 1980 constituted 315 million tons. After 20 years of work in the region, there were still enough rich oil deposits to investigate. To emphasize this potential, Soviet propaganda dubbed Western Siberia third Baku to succeed the second one in Tatarstan, Bashkiria and Perm, and the first one in Baku. However, in a scarcely populated region, there was not enough qualified workforce to intensify the efforts in a short period of time. Thus, in March 1980, at, at the high rank Politburo meeting, Maltsev offered an imperial solution. As the old Soviet institution, the Ministry of Oil Industry planned to use its right to engage employees of industries in the Soviet Republic, republics without negotiations and further permission from local political bodies. This idea paved the way to the concept of work in shifts. In order to spare the expenses on infrastructure, construction, and, and later oil drilling, specialists from Ukraine, Azerbaijan, Tatarstan, Bashkiria, and other regions would come to Western Siberia for a short period of intense work, and then, usually in two weeks, they would return home to recover. Western Ukraine became one of the regions to supply qualified workforce to Western Siberia. After World War I, territories of Habsburg Galicia were transferred to the Polish state, and after World War II, these lands were incorporated into the Ukrainian SSR. Soviet authorities established local educational institutions, which released skilled specialists of the oil industry. 1945, the Drohobych Oil College was established that got first graduates in 19. 48 and in total prepared 20,000 experts. In 1947, Faculty for Oil and Gas opened the Lviv Polytechnic Institute. And in 1967, you had Ivana Frankivsk National Technical University of Oil and Gas with 10,000 students, some of which you see in this, on this image. On top of its undergraduate classes, the Ivana Frankivsk Institute created a graduate program, experimenting with old drills or devising new equipment. Oil engineers wrote and defended dozens of PhD dissertations through the 1970s and 1980s. However, local deposits started to run out of oil by the middle of the 1970s. In 1976-1982, the rate of decline of the Ukrainian oil output was about 12% per year. The decline in economy also meant the, the decrease in wages. And here is an eloquent site. Um, and that's why Maltsev and his fellow ministers decided to introduce the principle of material interests, materialness and interest into the collective work in Siberia. If an average worker in the oil industry earned around 200 rubles a month, in Siberia, the average monthly income was about uh, 520 a month. These statistics on the slide show that categories of wages and material incentives were primary factors that made oil and gas drillers from other regions to take the decision and move to 
the regions of Uringoy and uh, Yamburg in the 1980s. It's interesting that transport, as you've seen, was also among the important factors. Might have saved the money on infrastructure in, and invested this in airports. And uh, 18 planes that, planes that departed from ivano frankivsk each week allowed 5,500 specialists from ivano frankivsk drilling department, IFUBR, to rotate between, between ivano frankivsk and Western Siberia. On a 4,500 kilometers route, they usually had several stops until they reached the final destination. Plane took Ukrainian drillers from ivano frankivsk to Moscow, then to the so-called anchor city of Tumen, from which they covered 1,000 kilometers to reach the base city, Bazovy Gorod of Nizhny Vartovsk. From there, a helicopter took them to the settlement of Radozhny, that was established in 1973 and became a town only in 1985. In the late 1970s and early 1980s, it was a marshy terrain near Varigan oil deposit, covered by oil wells, swamp platforms, and temporary houses. Uh, Uber in Ivano-Frankivsk had the base in Nizhnevartovsk from where the employees made their regular trips to oil derricks. In that sense, the center resembled a frontier post on the American West. Facilities there included a sawmill, a canteen, a gym, garages, a storehouse, but at the same time, there was no entertainment and particularly no infrastructure outside. Employees faced harsh conditions in shift work centers, frost, mosquitoes, absence of roads, absence of roads and 12 hour work shifts, along with separation from their families. These factors increased the employee's level of stress because of the low levels of oxygen, heart and respiratory diseases became common in the milieu. At the same time, harsh work strengthened friendship ties. Uber became a closed corporation. In the 1980s, the Ukrainian abbreviation for drilling department, Upravlinya Borove Hrobiv, was informally dubbed as Department for Close Relatives, Upravlinya Bliske Hrodeshi. In the 1980s, the State Planning Committee, Gosplan, planned to relocate specialists from distant republics to southern Siberia, promising them the liberty to build private houses there. However, this idea to construct new identity of frontier conquerors failed. Instead, employees of ivano frankivsk Uber continued to develop their local patriotism. They earned high incomes in Siberia, however, they invested these revenues into reconstruction of ivano frankivsk airport, as well as urban infrastructure. Some specialists who had local registration were allowed to receive an apartment in ivano frankivsk Some managed even to buy a car from the state. However, in the conditions of Soviet economy, there were not many ways to spend the earned money. Ultimately, these huge sums mostly burned after the collapse of the USSR. So in 1994, when the president of Russian Federation, Boris Yeltsin, announced his decision to nationalize oil deposits in Siberia, Ukrainians left the equipment and departed from their base. They moved further north to work in the Arctic village of Purpe. In 1998, some of ivano frankivsk specialists finally left Russia and some joined Russian companies. During our research, I managed to find ties to Lviv and ivano frankivsk in some biographies of several high rank Lukoil employees, Lukoil, the oil extracting, Russian oil extracting company. Anyway, the main conclusion of my talk and our project is that what is today perceived as Russian domestic industry was in fact built by efforts of the specialists from Soviet republics. Ukraine, Azerbaijan, Tatarstan, Bashkiria, and many others. Thank you for your attention, and I'd be grateful to hear your questions. 
And thank you, uh, Vaislava and Evgeny. And forgive me for maybe butchering your names, but it's so great to get the historical perspective on things going on in the Ukraine and, and the greater former Soviet Union. Um, we all know what's going on there now. Uh, I'm going to start my timer over here, so I try to keep it to 12 minutes. There's so much to talk about. Um, but here are the three big takeaways. Uh, there has been, as a result of this Russian war on Ukraine, there has been massive, you know this from reading the newspapers, there's been massive political movement. We'll talk some more about that. There's been a significant, I'll just call it rejection of Russian oil. Um, and since today's focus is oil, I'm going to keep it really focused on that. It's, it's quite interesting. Um, to the tune of around 3 million barrels a day of Russian oil is, is being effectively rejected by the market now. And as a result, there's been a significant, let's just say, oil price increase. And so the, the chart that I'm showing now, um, I, I think probably 98 or 100 percent of you would guess what the red arrow is where the price just goes spiking up to 125. That's the beginning of the war. That is exactly when Russia invaded Ukraine. And so you can see there's been a significant disruption in prices. And so all sorts of disruption. Um, so let's kind of walk through those. I'm gonna start with the Ukraine, move to Russia. Um, we'll talk about sanctions uh, and then we'll get to uh, supply and, and what, the, you know, what the possible impact of all of this is on, on global oil supply. And then on global oil demand because they're all tied together. Um, in complex ways. So circling back to uh, the very first presentation, really, um, Ukraine, oil production. Um, uh, it's, it's, not been, it's not been huge. Oil, Ukraine before the war, and I don't know what they're producing now, but surely it's been impacted, right? But before the war, Ukraine was producing about 50,000 barrels of oil every day. To put that in perspective, that's 1 20th of 1% of global oil demand. So just very little oil, right? It's just not a big oil producing region. Russia on the other hand is, and, and we'll talk some more about that. In fact, let me move my slide up top. This is, uh, this is a look at worldwide. There's lots of detail here. We don't need to dive into the detail right now, but this is a, a, a 30 year look uh, from 10 years ago uh, up to the present and then looking forward 10 years of demand. So you know, how much consumption you could think of in terms of oil. Um, and the key things to point out here, I just, I just want to show this at the beginning to give some perspective on the numbers because it's you can get lost if you don't know how much oil the world uses. Um, right before the pandemic, the world was consuming basically 100 million barrels of oil a day. Lots of different forms, gasoline and kerosene and diesel and blah, blah, blah. Uh, the pandemic smashed down that demand like below 91 to about 90 million barrels a day. Uh, last year saw it pick back up to about 96. And this year, with a caveat, because there's this war going on that will impact demand, um, we expected it to be around, almost back to 100 million barrels a day. So again, Ukraine's production is tiny, but Russia's production is huge relative to this demand. It's, it's roughly 10%. So pre-war, Russia was producing 10 and a half million barrels a day. Uh, it's the world's third largest oil producer uh, behind the United States and Saudi Arabia. and um, and Russia, what do they do with all that oil? Well, they don't use all of it themselves. Um, they export about 7.2 million barrels a day. So give or take, you know, 65 or 70% of their oil, they send off to other countries all over the world. Uh, and it generates about 36% of their federal budget revenues. Pretty significant bit. Uh, this is an interesting chart showing, you know, of that 7.2 million, uh, where does it go? and sort of broken into countries that are probably not going to back sanctions against Russia and countries that either are already and or probably will back sanctions against Russia. Um, the quick takeaway here would be if these countries, which are basically, it's almost entirely EU, America, uh, maybe some of the Asian countries, maybe Japan is in here as well, I bet. Um, 4.8 million of their 7.2 million uh, is two thirds of their exported oil which if you're doing quick math is 24% of their federal budget revenues. And this is massive disruption potentially here. Um, certainly some countries won't, won't sanction Russian oil, the Chinese and, and a few others. India is kind of, I can't decide if they're in or out. This is a quick chart um, showing uh, various countries uh, in Europe and what proportion of their um, oil and petroleum products are from Russia. And so you can see 
various degrees of dependency. Um, we don't need to dive into the details here. Uh, bottom line, Europe in particular is really dependent on Russian oil. Uh, again, like Poland, 70%, the UK, 12%, it, it varies, but, but it's, um, if you're not gonna take Russian oil, you have to figure out what you're gonna do instead. That's the point of this slide. And it's not just Europe, it's, uh, it's certainly uh, Asia and America as well, to, to a certain degree. Um, as far as Russia getting its oil out, it ships it out about eight, almost 85% uh, generally goes out through the Baltic Sea uh, and Black Sea ports. A little bit is shipped out of uh, Arctic uh, ports and the remainder goes, and I don't have it on the map here, sorry, but the remainder goes through a pipeline um, called the Druzhba pipeline, which I am told means ironically friendship. Um, that goes into Belarus and then it splits and goes down to the Ukraine and across to Poland. Um, it was built a long time ago when, well, when friendship actually sort of was meant to mean something and now it's just ironic. So all of this is going on. And so what is, um, what has been the response? Let's talk about sanctions for a bit. Um, the word unprecedented has become just like a totally overused, but I'm going to say it. Uh, this invasion sparked an unprecedented response from the OECD nations in terms of um, in terms of what they did. Immediately in March, Russian shipments of oil to the EU were down 1.5 million barrels a day. Russia takes about two thirds of those exports from Russia. So actually, if we went back up, Russia takes about, uh, you could say Russia takes about 4.8 million, uh, sorry, Europe takes about 4.8 million of those barrels uh, from Russia. And they immediately rejected 1.5. They were immediately down 1.5. So they immediately rejected a third of their usual imports from Russia. You can do that for a little while. You can't do that long term. Uh, but they did that without there being an official any official sanctions in place. Oil and gas companies began withdrawing. Um, BP almost immediately said, we're going to walk away from our 20% share in Rosneft. It's worth about $25 billion. We're just going to take the hit. Um, they'll probably try to sell it, but there probably will be no buyers. Um, and the Russians have imposed certain laws now that make it difficult. Shell is going to walk away from about four and a half billion dollar investment there or va value. Um, Exxon is going to walk away from four billion dollars. And Total, uh, Total Energy, the French company, which was originally a bit reluctant, they said, hey, why should we desert our assets there? It's like giving them to the Russians. It's helping them. Um, they now are subject to EU sanctions and have already decided they're going to take a four billion dollar hit on an Arctic LNG plant. And they'll probably have to leave other assets behind too. Um, the point was early on, um, there was, you know, we called it self-sanctioning. It wasn't really self-sanctioning. It was sort of auto-sanctioning. There weren't official sanctions, but, but um, this was such a big deal um, that companies took action of, of their own volition. Now the US, UK, Canada, Australia all have sanctions in place. The EU is moving that way as well. Um, and Germ Germany, like just this Tuesday said, they're gonna replace all the Russian oil within, they said within days. So like maybe it's today, but they've done it. Um, Russian oil is historically a third of German imports, but uh, had decreased to like 12% um, by last month. So um, massive changes afoot. Um, the impact of these sanctions is also nothing less than interesting. Um, over here on the right-hand side is what we call the Brent Ural differential. It's the difference in price that you're gonna pay for a barrel of oil, let's say from the North Sea, versus a barrel of oil from Russia, which is called Ural. Uh, the quick take on this, because I'm starting to run short of time here because it's too exciting, is it, it's a really steep discount right now. It's a bargain. It's a bargain time to buy Russian oil. It, it sells for 30 or $35 per barrel less than on the global market. So what's Russia doing? They're looking for bargain shoppers and they're finding some. Uh, there are some trading shops um, who are taking advantage of this Ural's discount but mostly people are still not taking it, even at this price, which is super interesting because there's a lot of money to be made on this sort of the arbitrage between this and the global price. And so as a result, if you're producing more than you're selling, you have to put it in storage. And every country that produces oil has storage available. So does Russia. It's filling up. In fact, I think it's like full to full-ish. Um, and when it gets full, then you have to slow down production because there's, in, in Russia's case now, there's literally no other outlet. And so we're already seeing decrease in production. 
Uh, in fact, the, the, Ener the Russian energy ministry itself said they, they've seen a 7.5% decrease of, of production rates um, by the middle of this month already. They could end up uh, easily down their production decreasing from 10.5 down to 7.5 or 8 million barrels a day. So bottom line, 3 million barrels is sort of being rejected by, by markets um, and, uh, and it's off the market. And so the world, back to the, the demand chart, well, it's not next, but back to the demand chart, the world is still consuming a lot of oil. So when you take 3 million barrels off the market, it's a huge hit. Uh, and so what's the world gonna do? There are a few things going on. OPEC, I'll make this one short and sweet. OPEC isn't doing much. They're gradually increasing. They move rather methodically, usually. They're increasing about 400,000 barrels a day. They were already doing that, so they haven't changed their course. The US, without taking too much time to explain this plot, is dumping oil out of its strategic petroleum reserve at the rate of a million barrels a day. They're gonna do it for six months. Uh, so that's feeding some oil into the market. You see companies accelerating projects and sanctioning big investment decisions quickly. Um, if the current sanctions on Iran were to be lifted, that would bring another 500,000 to a million barrels to the market. But really probably the most responsive to, de to demand will be the US. Too complicated to go through this chart in detail, but um, base, like if nothing changed, if the war hadn't happened, the US was gonna increase about a million barrels a day over the next year and a half or so, uh, just because of the drilling rate there. Uh, if they increase the drilling rate, which they already have, companies have been very judicious there for about the last year or two, to, so they can actually make some money. Um, but they've already picked up more drilling rigs. That's this green dot line, and that's going to lead to more production. And if they increase their drilling rate even more, which could happen, um, we'll see increases of, of possibly as much as 3 million a day come out of the states within a couple of years. Back to the demand slide. Um, we think that the impact of what's going on will certainly slow growth, right? Growth last year was, um, was uh, well, growth last year was, you can see it here on the chart, was about 3 million barrels a day. It was projected to be another 3 million barrels a day this year. Um, it's definitely gonna slow down. Russia and the Ukraine, demand is way down for obvious reasons and the rest of the world demand is down because price is high. And so we'll see a decrease to maybe a million and a half barrels. Um, and if, if, Lots of, lots of moving pieces here, but if there are full sanctions on the Russian barrels, then we see oil price going to as much as $150, $160 a barrel and demand actually staying flat. Um, and that involves all sorts of economic repercussions that Sean could probably tell you all about. Um, mainly, it means a, a pretty hefty recession. So really quick high take on global oil and demand. 